Hey traders, it's Paul Robinson here, Daily FX. Welcome to today's session of Becoming a Better Trader. We have a Q&A session today. How's it going, Tony? Mr. Robinson. Please call me Paul. <laughs> I like informalities. How's it going, Greta? All right, so today's a Q&A session. So this is all about you guys and and uh, what you're what's on your mind uh, before we get started though I just want to make sure you guys can, can you guys hear me you should see my wrist disclaimer up there right now just want to get a verification that we are a go hey how's it going Augusto alright so it looks like we're good on that give yourself a few seconds move on to the next one and then we'll get started All right, so for those of you who have been attending these for a while, and there's quite a few of you who have, and it's much appreciated, and I hope these have been helpful, these webinars, between the lessons and the Q&As. Uh, but today's a Q&A. Last week we did a lesson. Try to get another lesson up there next week, do a little rotation here. That way we can go through the topics and then each subsequent week following we can, uh, can do the questions and and uh, hopefully help bring clarification to the stuff that we talk about during the uh, the lesson webinars but what do we talk about here for those of you who've been here you already know uh, how these work for those of you who are new uh, we talk about psychology what's holding you back uh, things that are mental impediments that we all have that maybe uh, a sticking point for you talk about risk management any questions related to risk management trade execution entry stops exit strategy related pertaining to your game plan which I hope all of you by now have uh, how to handle specific situations you are having a drawdown maybe you're having a good period and you're 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 getting sloppy and you want to you want to make sure that you uh, are staying on course what we don't ask, <laughs> what we don't talk about are market specific questions so please don't ask me about about the euro uh, and, and what it's doing right now. Uh, we reserve those for Tuesday, Wednesdays and Friday webinars which by the way brings me to we, tomorrow there will not be a London FX and CFD trading webinar. Uh, I am off. Uh, it, we will resume next week. So let's get started. Augusto says central banks are holding me back in messy markets. Well, messy markets and uh, and, and and low volatility are certainly a uh, a challenge. It, it's not a it's not necessarily a a good excuse for for not making money, uh, but at the same time, uh, when when markets get messy, and I certainly feel you there. Uh, Gusto, uh, you've got it. the the key is, and I know you've been around for a while, so you know this stuff. Uh, but the key is to to keep it light. Uh, if the market environment is not conducive to your trading, uh, the last thing you want to do is is force it and press the issue, uh, because market conditions change, uh, and in low volatility environments, you just, you got to be real patient. Uh, you've got to kind of just sit back and and this should always be the case but you gotta let the trades come to you and not go go hunting for the trades Greta says I go back to these webinars frequently thank you so much they help me to keep me on the straight and narrow well I'm glad to hear that that's what that's what these are here for this is actually my favorite uh, webinar as I've, I've said before uh, I, I enjoy doing this webinar because I think it's you know there's too much there's too much focus I think on on the specifics of of you know, the analysis and whatnot, and while that is very important, and you have to have at least decent to good analysis to be able to make good trading decisions. At the end of the day, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of good analysis out there, but it, this is all about having the, the the rubber meet the road, if you will, uh, and being able to put it into action and. And the biggest challenge, really, ultimately in trading, is is ourselves. 
uh, it's it's one of those things that uh, you're you're it's it's kind of you it's not you against the market it's you against you because there's there's always there's always good opportunities out there uh, just not always an ample supply like right now with with volatility low uh, this week has been a little bit of a surprise it certainly the market wasn't pricing in some of these moves that we've seen uh, I did not have expectations of seeing the euro trade a 114 handle uh, but it certainly did I thought we'd get back up to 113 and then and and then maybe it would stall out and and I'm already breaking my own rule on what not to talk about so we're not gonna talk about the euro anymore but if you've just in this environment you got to keep it tight for sure aid says hi Paul I hope you're doing well I am thank you I hope you are too uh, how effective is RSI to gauge overbought oversold also, if entering a trade based on a daily chart, is it okay to use the one-hour chart to gauge entry? All right, so that's that's a two-part question there. First of all, addressing RSI. So I'm not a big fan of oscillators, uh, but I have, and I've said this in the past, RSI. If I had to pick an oscillator, uh, I would say RSI is probably the the one that I would gravitate towards and in fact in the past it's one that I used uh, and it took me a while to to actually get away from it um, and, there, and and the reason I got away from it is because that I, I just found I just found that I was I was being more influenced at times by by the overbought oversold indications of it as opposed to price levels and I would maybe get out prematurely because it was quote unquote oversold or overbought and then it would end up getting to that price resistance or price support and, and then ultimately that's where I really wanted to get out uh, but you know I mean using the in confluence uh, for example if you've got a price level and you've got RSI it can give you it can certainly give you more confidence and, and a lot of times you know and I and I and some of you may recall I've mentioned this before I, I had a I have a friend who who is a former colleague uh, and we traded on the same desk and we actually sat next to each other and he uh, he he based most of his decisions on on other factors and and a lot of it was price action primarily uh, and he might use some light overarching fundamental theme uh, to to dictate his trading decisions but he also had stochastics on his chart and I and I would ask him I said hey JD why 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 are you using stochastics and I was just I was really curious because he'd be he got all hot to trot on stochastics and this is a guy who'd been trading for quite a while and he's like. It's like I don't know. It just makes me feel good <laughs> when I see it really oversold. And he always had kind of a long bias, even when the market was going down. He was very good at, at finding those turning points. And he'd be like, I don't know. It makes me feel good <laughs> when I see it's really oversold. And and he really had other factors, but but it was just kind of like that 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 third uh, unspoken factor. And and so sometimes sometimes the things that we use, I guess. You could, they don't necessarily have to have the most logical uh, reasoning. Uh, if you're it probably, you probably could have got rid of it and still did just as just as fine. But but you know, it was just it was an interesting answer in that it made them feel good. And to some degree, you know, there is some validity to that. It, it gave them a little extra confidence uh, to maybe put on a little more size or or what have you. So when it comes to something like RSI and I, I don't really like stochastics it, it, like at all, uh, but but some people do. I my problem is with price derived uh, indicators is just that it's a derivative, so I just assume get right to the right to what actually formulates these things. And if you ever crack open the code to a lot of these things, uh, there's there's they're very similar in in many respects. The math behind them. Uh, the one thing I will say is that if you are going to use some oscillators, make sure that you're not using, uh, there's no redundancy and that you're using multiple oscillators that essentially tell you the same thing because then you can get a false sense of uh, confluence or confirmation by having multiple oscillators doing the same thing, right? And as far as trade entry goes, the other part of your question was, uh, if entering a trade based on a daily chart, is it okay to use a one-hour chart to gauge entry? 
Absolutely. I mean, that's it's getting a, a little more advanced. Um, I I think for the for the newer trader, I think it's better to just keep it simple and and, and try to just kind of master you know, the one time frame that you're looking at. But if you're at that point where you're you're able to 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 kind of look at the picture multi dimensional, if you will, um, it, it's certainly how I enter uh, a lot of trades. Uh, so you know you'll see something happen on the you know on the daily, and then maybe maybe you'll you'll then say okay you know what the the bigger picture uh, trade maybe is down right. And so you want to be short based off of the daily, but you, but you want to kind of get in there and, and, and refine your entry. Uh, so you, then you get down to like say the four hour, the one hour, and you use that as an entry. And, and then you have you know maybe a tighter stop and, and, and whatnot in there. Uh, it certainly is a good way to, to get better entries, uh, to increase your risk reward. Uh, it's just the one thing you have to do though is you have to be able to differentiate so if you enter if if your signal is on the daily chart and you enter on a one hour but really you're you're going off the daily you can't then become too focused on the one hour that was just kind of to get your entry more refined you kind of got to shift back to that bigger time frame then so that way you make sure that you're you're not because what'll happen is is you'll you'll have an idea off the daily chart and then and then you'll get that that more refined entry on the one hour and all of a sudden you become fixated on the one hour and you know, it'll make a you'll make a move and you, you'll end up getting out of the trade and you, you you'll later realize well wait a minute I, I should still be in this because my signal is actually on the daily uh, so I hope that makes sense. Gusto says after this big move after these big moves by central banks it is better to stay away and watch the market come to you correct yes absolutely I think so I mean anytime there's you know anytime there's uh what the DAX just keeps selling off doesn't it uh, any anytime you there's confusion or the, or or anytime you're you're in doubt you know it's it's kind of one of those things where you just you got to take a step back you know, it's it, 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 it's a constant. I I have to do this all the time. I have to step back and say, okay, you know what? The trading maybe right now is is not it's not hitting on point for me. Uh, the market's not quite moving in in a manner. It's not respecting the levels maybe that I necessarily am looking at. And so in that case, you kind of got to step back because it's one of those things. Like if you kind of imagine, if you're sitting at your desk. You know, and you're watching the market and you're kind of uninspired by what's going on and there's some confusion and central banks are doing this and you're watching them and they, they don't really make a lot of sense to what you know what you're thinking and and uh, or you know whatever whatever it is those factors that, that influence your trading decisions if those things aren't really you know if you're sitting back you know you, you may be uninspired to trade and but then there's still that that, that desire that that need for for being able to to take advantage of the market, and if you force if you force trading during that period, when you're sitting back in your chair and you're like going, eh, I don't really, but I really I, I want to make some money here. You know, there's things moving around, and I know somebody's making money, and, and I want to be involved. Uh, you really got to think about to yourself, well, what's the downside there? Am I going to be upset with myself if I lose money in this environment? Because what happens is then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, things start to make sense. And if you've if you've suffered some losses because you've been forcing it, if you suffered some losses you know, forcing your trading, then all of a sudden uh, when you have that good opportunity that you really want, you might be a little trigger shy. You may not want to take that trade, or you may take it, you know, very small because you've you've, you've suffered some what I would call unnecessary losses by forcing it and then you don't take advantage of the of the good trade and, and so to me it's like again you know you're sitting back you're kinda uninspired and then all of a sudden you, you kinda sit up and you go oh wow that that's that's interesting you know that the markets move into the the price zone that I'm looking at and and this is kinda lining up and and, and you get excited so I, I kinda you know I'm always like it's it's like a you know, you're always kind of keeping tabs and on your, you know, having self-awareness on on your conviction level, because uh, you you can't really manage a trade very well, uh, and you can't can't make good trades without a lot of conviction, right? So you've you've got to have conviction in, in what you're doing, and if you find yourself wavering, 
you, know, you get into a trade and you're kind of finding yourself going, eh, you know, I, I think it's it's probably not the trade. You know, it's one of those things where you get in and you'd be like, you know what, I can accept the loss on this trade. Yeah. If I lose on this trade, that's okay. Because you know what? It's the trade I'm supposed to take. So I think it's kind of a good a good mental approach to take. Steve says on strategy, thoughts on use use of moving averages and the best types, i.e. simple, exponential. Um a lot of traders use moving averages. Uh, I'll give you, uh, and you, you ask about simple and exponential. Um, well, the, 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 the difference between simple and exponential, for those of you who maybe aren't aware, is simple is just what it is. It's just the simple average of price. Exponential has a component in there uh, which puts more weight into recent price. So, so you will see that a simple and exponential do vary. Uh, what I would say to that, because there are there are there are people in both camps. There are people who will use a simple. There are people who will use an exponential. Uh, I've I've in the past used them both. What I will say is this: they both can work. <laughs> uh, the the best way I think to approach it is to be consistent in either using simple or use exponential. And my my hang up though with moving averages is that you could take and I, and we've talked about this before and I've, I haven't done it actually in live example and maybe I should one of these days uh, is that you could take you could open up an Excel spreadsheet and there's there's a random number generator in there uh, just so that you're not poking out random numbers out of your head that may be you know something in, you might have been influenced subconsciously and you, you come up with these numbers but anyways if you use Excel that has a random number generator and if you generate the number uh, any number you put for an input for a moving average whether it be a 20-day a 27-day an 84 170 whatever it be you'll find that, that that there's some some support and resistance and that that you know they'll if the trend is up they'll both they'll all be pointing one way you know so uh, and, and another f point to add on to that is simple versus exponential is that whatever inputs you use be consistent in using them uh, because markets do operate off of varying degrees so you know there's there's a lot of a lot of a lot of people out there you'll see they'll use like a 21 like an 8 21 55 which are all Fibonacci numbers so that's the the reasoning behind that uh, then others will use like a 50 a 20 uh, and, and say the 100 the 200 uh, I really only focus on the 200 on the daily uh, because the 200 is is what I is probably the most influential uh, that that I know that that everybody else is looking at and it's been like that for a long time. Uh, now putting a 200 on an hourly chart I think is is kind of silly. It doesn't really make a lot of uh, sense to me. It's like 8.7 days or something like that. Uh, and so to me it's you, know, you can't really take like I see you know I even see people who are experienced and I'll see it on Twitter and they'll be like the 200 day moving average on the hourly chart and I'm like wait what? that that doesn't you know that doesn't really jive with me so that, i guess the at the end of the day steve i there's i don't have an issue with moving averages and i think that i think that if you use them just be consistent in what you use the inputs and be consistent in whether you use simple or exponential steve consistency is key yes absolutely you know it's it's uh Consistency is is probably the primary. Uh, there there's so many there's so many things out there. You know, I, I look at other people's analysis, and there's just so many different ways that people slice and dice the market. And and I'm talking you know in in ways that I wouldn't really think of. And and then I and I and I maybe agree or disagree, but they, if they do it consistently, the 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 ones that I've seen that have been successful even though they may have to me what is a peculiar way of looking at the market the most important thing is is they do the same thing over and over and over uh, it's not it's not so much about having the most precise or the best strategy or the best analysis uh, we've talked about that before 
you know you don't have to it's not rocket science you don't have to try to try to perfect all the technical aspects and I don't mean just technical by analysis I mean technical and and, and you know the analytical portion whether it's whether it's looking at fundamental data uh, you know following central banks uh, as Augusta was talking about uh, or or technical analysis which which is a primary a primary focus for for the shorter term trader of course because fundamentals tend to be a, a, a slower moving thing but the bottom line is yes consistency 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 Jason says what about linear regression channels well first off Jason when I hear the word linear I get I get, I get scared uh, linear regression because it, it is a uh, it is just that it's linear and when I think of linear I think of you know a lot of I think of economists and their linear thinking uh, in, in and markets aren't very linear uh, so it, it's like using standard deviation which I'm kind of guilty of using uh, in, in some respects uh, but anytime you have anything that's kind of really like conforming mathematically uh, Gaussian mathematics if you will they don't really they don't really uh, represent it, it's difficult to model human behavior so anytime I see anything that's kind of linear or anything of that nature I, I, I tend to shy away from but I don't actually have experience um, with linear regression channels I've seen them before I think I've thrown them up on a chart but I've never really uh, I, I would prefer to use channels that are more naturally derived. Of course, it's subjective. Ones where you draw a trend line, uh, and then you and then you have the parallel, which is something that and, and Jason, I think I've, I've seen you at a, at a few of my uh, analytical webinars. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of parallels, uh, and and so drawing a trend line that has multiple connecting points, and then finding the parallel of that. Uh, which is just basically copying the line and then moving it. Uh, I, I find that those are a little more, uh, those are a little better uh, because you're you're using more of the natural market movement as opposed to uh, imposing something uh, that that perhaps is is already kind of kind of set. So uh, technical analysis is obviously there's a there's a ton of subjectivity to it. Uh, so and when you do draw channels you've got to you know you've obviously got to use your use your best judgment oh hang on one second Steve oh an execution Steve do you have a strategy for adding to winning positions if so what criteria do you use um, I do now it's not a strategy that I use on every single trade uh, it's a strategy. There, there are some who are very systematic about how they add to winning trades. Um, my, my adding to a winning trade evolves around basically setups within setups, if you will. So, you know, I'll take a, take an entry uh, on on one signal, and then as it moves in my favor, there maybe perhaps is another entry uh, that that arrives. So I could have, say, a pattern within a pattern. Let's say a price pattern that gets me in, and then there's maybe on a shorter term time frame, there's another price pattern uh, that gets me involved as well. So then I would add in that situation, and then I would treat the two as separate trades, effectively, uh, in terms of risk management. So you'd manage your original idea, and then you would manage the add-on. Now there are all kinds of ways to to do that. Um, and to also then to add further to that in terms of a, a winning trade, if there's a ton of momentum in the market, one of my favorite uh, favorite trailing stops is to use the prior prior bar uh, prior bar higher low. So if I'm short and the market's going down, if the if there's a lot of momentum and and I think that that we could see a really extended move. Um, I won't get out of the trade on the trailing stop portion of the trade until the the bar closes a bullish bar closes above the last bearish bar if that makes sense uh, let me see if maybe I can just kind of give a illustration 
Um, let's let's use this as an example for that. So because there is a lot of questions about, and and so I'm actually bringing a question myself, I guess, uh, by adding on to that about trailing stops. Now, for example, let's say over here, you know, we had a nice consolidation. S and P broke out. Let's say you got long, and you said, you know what, we're we're in record territory, and I'm not going to get out until until there's some bearish price action. And in this case, using that strategy that I was just talking about, you would, if you were long, you wouldn't get out of the trade until you had a a close below the last, the low of the last bullish bar. Uh, and in which case here, if you got long here, all these were were closes above the prior low. And even though we dipped below the prior day's low, we still closed above it. And so over here, we closed right near it. It would actually have come over here so that would have been this was the this was the last bullish bar I consider this to be the last really bullish bar and then so once we went below and closed below the lower there then you would exit that's a that's a trailing stop uh, idea that I've that I've found to be effective for for markets that have a lot of momentum so I kind of created a question out of your question <laughs> um, all right, so let's see here. Justin, what about divergence between price action and oscillator? What about divergence between price action and oscillator? Oh, I see. <laughs> the question got copied in there twice. Um, okay, so that's something that's very common. Um, that is another, that's another strategy that, that, that you, know, you see, I've seen successful traders use. Um, so they'll have RSI divergence. Which is again, if we're getting back to the one oscillator that I I personally would say, okay, you know what, if you're going to use an oscillator, I would say it's RSI. Uh, divergence between price and an oscillator, it it, it basically is what it is. Is it's a graphic uh, representation of momentum, right? That that is turning. So it it suggests that momentum, you know, if we're in an uptrend and the price pulls back and makes a new higher high and RSI doesn't make the higher high, then that would be your divergence and it suggests that that momentum is starting to uh, to decline and, and that that new high uh, is perhaps not going to be sustainable. And so in that case, you know, I, I to me it's it's one of those things where I guess I guess because I've watched price action for so long and it's so closely, I can kind of tell you when those divergences are, are actually happening. Uh, but for a graphical representation to be able to visually see it and say, okay, you know what, this is what's going on here, uh, it, it, it's it's one of those things where I, I think that it, it can be an effective way to do it, and and quite a few people do use it. So I certainly wouldn't discourage uh, using it. There's not a lot of things that I would discourage people from from using, uh, it, it, as long as there's there's some kind of logic behind it. Uh, for the most part, uh, again, I was talking earlier about somebody using one because it makes them feel good. Uh, <laughs> uh, but as long as you don't have redundancies, you know, you're not trying to look for, for example, that that's a pretty simple way of viewing the market, which I think is great. Uh, where I think that that people tend to to get tripped up is that they'll start looking at divergence between indicators and uh, and, and what have you. Um, I, one way of looking at that I don't like that I see occasionally is is where there will be divergence where the the oscillator will actually move to a a, a point uh, and then the price won't and then they use that divergence. I think it's best used if you've got the oscillator not confirming price, not the other way around. I hope that made sense. John. How's it going, John? I have started learning about Forex and it's been two months. I think just everyone is better than me. <laughs> no, John, that's not the case. Uh, so I'm going to put your mind at ease right there. Uh, and, and here's the other thing. Don't think about anybody else. All right, because it doesn't. What other people are doing don't matter. So I'm going to I'm going to start on that before I go into the rest of your uh, your question. First of all, so you bring up a, a really good point there. I just you think that everyone is better than you. First of all, you've been you've been in this for two months. Okay, two months is like five minutes. 
Okay, it's 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 a very short amount of time. Uh, you're still figuring things out. It's going to take you a while. Uh, it's going to take you six months, a year before you really start to start to get somewhere uh, in terms of understanding what it is that, that works for you. Uh, because you're going to go through, you know, you're going to go through this learning curve of of using different types of analysis. You're going to read, you know, you're going to go on Twitter, you're going to read books, you're going to come on dailyfx.com and you're going to listen to me and you're going to listen to other analysts and and you're going to say, "Oh, that makes sense. Let me give that a try and and let me do this and and let me do that." So you're going to go through a learning curve. So first of all, you know, you've got to you, I'm sure you already understand this, but that's you, you can't so don't beat yourself up when when things aren't quite going your way because they shouldn't be going your way 2 months in or otherwise you would you'd be a prodigy uh, uh, per se and so with that said don't beat yourself up on that and number two don't worry about what other people are doing because in different different market environments uh, different people do well and, and some don't do well right so that's that's one of those things there where it's it's some people they, they like range bound markets and they can fade levels. Other people like to see breakouts and trade those breakouts and catch those extended moves, like some of those yen uh, crosses, like look at euro yen, sterling yen, like those are momentum beasts, but those aren't for everybody. Uh, so the bottom line is, is that is that it, the market isn't always going to, you know, I've I've, I've found this and, and it and it can be a little frustrating. If you don't put it into perspective, but I found that you know somebody will make money in one market, and and another person won't. And the person who's not making money is looking at the person making money and going, oh well, I should be involved there. I, I should have made money. And and the thing is, is you know at the end of the day, you've got to have a game plan, a process. It, you've got to be consistent about following it. And then over time, if it's a good game plan, if it's a good process, over time, you know you'll you'll be able to then have a better shot at being profitable uh, so don't worry about what other people are doing and and uh, you know that's that's the last thing that you can worry about because then it just adds pressure to yourself then it, it causes you to do things that you wouldn't do yeah I, I've been on trading desk where that's I've seen that divergence and you know and I'm thinking about one example uh, with with uh, with a, a friend of mine he 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 didn't do really well in very volatile markets and a lot of guys around were, were making a lot of money and it was very frustrating for him but when the market calmed down those other guys would start losing money and he would do well and he was he was very focused on the fact that that other people are doing well around him and when you're on a trading desk you're surrounded by people so you see it you see their you know you see their them doing well or you see them doing poorly and it's right there in front of you uh, which is why you know I think it's it's actually a good idea to, to not always be around people and and whatnot because then you won't be influenced by that and, and I'm sure that's the case with you so don't don't worry about it you know if you're if you're on Twitter and you see everybody's you know oh I did this did did, did you know first of all you don't know if they did it or not and second of all who cares because different markets work for different people uh, John, and then the the next thing you say, what do you consider a profitable trader, and how long it takes? Okay, I, I kind of got into that. Uh, you know, I, I think that you know you really got to give yourself a good six months to a year. I'd say a year, I, even longer it can be before you get really uh, to a point of of true consistency. Market environment can make a difference. Um, sometimes you get a really really good market environment when the trader starts, and and they kind of in a way get a little lucky. Uh, because they're just kind of following along and you get this huge trend and they just all they do is just keep buying or shorting and then then all of a sudden markets change and then they don't do so well and then that's when they realize oh maybe I didn't know as much as I thought I did uh, one second okay so so yeah it could it, you know it could take it could take six months a year I would say you know you know, a, a year would be you know, your first year is going to be a lot about learning. John says, "Do you believe that all people will follow who follow the basic rules will win in this market?" Uh, no, I don't, because because well, that's that's actually the problem is that the rules get broken quite often. Uh, we we allow our emotions and human nature to to get involved, and that that can be a problem. Uh, so then it, what ends up happening is the rules don't get followed all the time. 
uh, it's so if you if if say just on a, on a scale if there's ten rules for example, uh, if you're consistently following say seven of the ten, uh, then then you're 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 probably doing all right. You know if you're following two out of ten, then you're probably not doing all right. Um, it, it's very difficult to be you know to to seek you know seek out perfection if you will. <laughs> Aid says I am six months into this, still trying to figure. Some things out. Yep, exactly. I mean, it's you know, it it, it is. And in the beginning, it is. It's exciting and it can be frustrating at the same time. But you gotta you gotta really hang in there and just. And and another thing is is when you're when you do uh, when you do look for what it is that you want to do, right? In terms of the analysis that that resonates with you, uh, how you're going to handle your risk. You know, we've talked about this before. You've got to have a game plan. You've got to have a game plan. If you don't have a game plan, then then you're really uh, uh, and, and I'm going to drop a link. You know, it's funny the the game plan webinar I had never archived, and I can't I can't seem to find it. It's the one I didn't record. It's like literally like the only one I didn't record. But here's one. It's focusing on the process. I dropped a link in the general box, but it kind of talks about the game plan. Um, you, you've got to have a game plan in place. But what I was going to say is that whatever you're like you're you're using as analysis, you got to give it a little time to work before you decide that it's not working. So don't jump around from one week to the next using the strategy or one day to the next. You know, somebody will have a losing day, and the next day they're like trying something else, and the next week they're trying something else, and then, then a month later they're doing something else, and then you're not going. That's not consistent. You're not even giving it a shot. And like I said, even if you stick with a mediocre strategy. As long as you do it consistently, you're going to find yourself in a position to be able to uh, capitalize. Um, it's when you jump around from one strategy to the next, then you're inconsistent that that you have a lot of problems. So, you know, I it, it, you've really got to give it give it a little time before you decide that that it's not for you and and that you need to try something different. Gusto says, "I am the same as your friend. I don't like big moves; only normal moves." Yeah, that's fine. I mean, and that's and that's that's you know, and people get they get FOMO, <laughs> fear of missing out, when they see a big move and they think that everybody in the world made money and except for them. And here's the thing: big moves mean that other people lost a lot of money too. So if you want to put your mind at ease, somebody else lost a ton of money. Because that's what causes a big move is is a big shift in in, in in a lot of buyers and a lot of sellers and there's always people on that other side of that that tape. So if you want to put it that way and think, you know, I missed this big move, well, you could have been you could have been on the wrong side of that big move too. So if if it's if if getting into big moves, I mean, ideally we like we all like to catch big moves and and you should catch a big move from time to time. Uh, if if you're doing things properly, but it, the the really big moves are not that common, you know. It's 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 a lot more of just what Augusto said, quote unquote, normal moves. Uh, it's like when we have these events where you know we'll see the euro move 400 points on on Draghi and the ECB, like it it did a couple of times over the last year or so, and I can tell you right now, I I didn't I didn't do anything on either of them. And I didn't really care, and I knew people who who crushed it on those, and I didn't really care. Why didn't I care? First of all, my analysis didn't tell me that I should be in the trade, so I couldn't beat myself up for that because you know that's that's where you get that that whole oh, I knew it, but did you really? No, you didn't. <laughs> your analysis didn't tell you that it was going to happen, and so you missed the big move. And then your your year and your month and and whatever should not be defined by just a few uh, outlier events. Jack, I usually trade better when I have a clear bias, and when I don't have one, I just stay out of the market and observe. Is that a good habit to have? What do you think, Jack? I think so. I think so for sure. Uh, you, you, you definitely, uh, you, you, you definitely uh, want to have a good bias. You want to be clear. Um, 
and it, it it should be one of those things where yeah I mean if, if you if you have a clear bias a broader bias and, and I agree with that you'll you'll be sticking to your analysis uh, maybe on the shorter term so a lot of people will have a, a general broad overarching theme and and then they'll see something that fits within that theme on the shorter term and it's it's a lot easier for them to uh, to, to handle and manage those trades so I would certainly agree with that that you yeah, absolutely and and if you are able to do that that's great discipline you know if you're you know I, I it's it's like you, you kinda wanna what happens here is is that people get too too involved in the market where it's almost like tunnel vision and they look at it so closely that they lose perspective right they just start looking at the trees and not the forest not to get all cliche on you guys and you get too close to the market and when you get that when you get too close to the market you become hypersensitive to every fluctuation and whatnot I think it's best to have the market at arm's length and say if this happens and another thing I think is a great idea is that you say is that you put together themes or ideas and you say if this happens if it gets to this point right if, if these things line up this is what I'm going to do if it doesn't, then I'm not going to do anything, because what will happen is if it does start to work out that way. So I always have scenarios. I all the time have scenarios. I have like a thousand head and shoulders that I've never traded, because they never actually became head and shoulders. But I say if this happens at this point in time, I'm going to be ready to trade. And when it does happen, you're going to have a lot of conviction. So by doing that, you know, you kind of already plan out what you're going to do in advance, and then when the market conforms to what it is that you're, uh, what you're thinking. Then you have a lot of a lot of conviction. It's a great approach. Sure thing, John. I'm glad. I'm glad to uh, have been able to answer your question uh, in a helpful manner. Mohammed, hi Paul. Thanks for the helpful webinar. Sure thing. I've got a question on how to draw a trend line with one high and expectation or uh, expecting the next high um, all right I, I think I know what you're, you're going at with that and so trend lines trend lines are subjective um, <laughs> as we as we all know uh, the one thing that I will say uh, is that trend lines so some people draw them We'll just use this S&P chart, I guess, as an example. It's not going to be the best example, but some people will say, okay, you know what? I've got to have only high prices. So in this case, this well, here's how I draw it, and then I'll just kind of go in on this. This isn't really a great chart to do this with. Uh, maybe I'll have to, I have to think of something right now. Uh, but this would be the high price, and then in order to draw this, you'd have to touch this other high price. Or you can do it the way that I do it. I try to include as many inflection points within reason. So, for example, this is a topside trend line. This is this is one of those uh, that some people uh, tend to tend to ignore. Uh, but if if you see here, we've got a, a point of interest in the market. We've got a point of interest. We've got another point of interest. Another point of interest. We almost had one there. Now, if you were to draw it from just top to top say using that point and this point then you wouldn't be including this or this so to me it's really about the number of inflection points um, as you can see here there's a lot on the slope so slopes are something that I like to use which can pass through price action you can see here that there was a couple of points of inflection and then there were some over here as well we can see that it was clearly playing along that that trend line um, and that's something I think. Let me see. I think it was Eurozzi. Yes, Eurozzi. So Eurozzi to me, it was about when I this trend line here. As you could see, it doesn't connect. Uh, this is a slope more than it is a trend line, just because it's it is passing through price action. But you can see here that it touches here. You can even see that, that there was a point where the market bounced. You can see where the market even had a day where it tried to bounce around it. You can see over here where it went through it a little bit. You can also see here it turned lower from it and then it used it on multiple points. Uh, and then we actually, yesterday, we turned right off of it. So I, I try to include within reason as many points as possible. 
I hope that answered your question. It's 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 a it's a subjective thing for sure, um, but I don't I'm not I'm not a perfectionist when it comes to trend lines. I just try to find points of interest in the market and connect as many as those as I can, uh, and and then go from there. But yeah, we had a nice little turn yesterday right from that that particular uh, line. Yeah, good, uh, Jack. That's that's that's. Uh, he says he just wanted to have another more experienced opinion on whether I have a, a bad habit or not. Yeah, I mean that's no, it's certainly uh, keeping the market at arm's length is is great, which is effectively what you're doing. Uh, you're not you're not getting overly caught up, and it means you probably don't have a gambler's mentality. <laughs> you know, you're not seeking action. You're letting the action come to you when it when it when it arrives, which is which is great. Um, all right. Anybody else got any other questions? You guys are, you guys are a little quiet today? <laughs> Don't be shy. You can ask me anything. Just about anything. As long as it's related to, uh, to, it's not related to the markets, as I said before. Yeah, Gusto. I know that's one of your. That's kind of your forte. He says my game plan is is out of trading of central banks meet on central bank meetings, or trading or new uh, trading out news after the storm. Yeah, that's certainly you know I I sat next to a guy who uh, that's all he did was trade uh, news and data, and you trade the price action around it. Afterwards, he always had a game plan, and uh, if if it fit within his game plan, he was a good example of somebody who traded news, traded a fundamental event, had very light technical analysis uh, overlaid with his process, and he would he would uh, he'd say, okay, you know what? And he specialized. So this was one of the things he also specialized in in, a, in specific pairs, and he traded a lot of uh, dollar max. And he would say, "Okay, there's, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a number coming out at, at 12:30 GMT, a U.S. number." Uh, and he'd have his scenarios, and he'd be like, "Okay, these are my like three scenarios, four scenarios, and and uh, and depending on you know the magnitude of of the data and whatnot, then he would trade after that, and and uh, and and he was he was pretty good at doing it." Tony asked, "Why is Friday a busy day?" Well, there's a lot of data usually that comes out on Fridays, right? A lot of big data comes out. Uh, it's it's an it's an end of the week. Uh, there's actually a study, and I believe I believe don't quote me on this. Uh, for the this goes, I believe, for the S and P 500, that with each subsequent day in the week, volatility increases. So Monday, you know. If you've been around any time, you know Mondays can be kind of dead. It's kind of like Mondays remind me. You think about it, you want a, you want a true example of psychology in the markets, barring some kind of event over the weekend or some crazy move on Friday, like really crazy. Mondays can be very sleepy. It's 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 almost like the people, right? It's almost like it's like the the weekend, you know, kind of hangover. And the market's the same way. It'll start out all like kind of. You know, just not really like it's kind of searching for a direction, and 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 it, it's it's you know there's not a lot of data that comes out on Mondays. So while I'm not a fundamental trader, I trade technically, right? When I know there's a lot of events for the week or on a particular day like Fridays, I know that there's going to be some good price action, right? So uh, Fridays, you know, there tends to be I mean, you've got non-farm payrolls on Fridays, right? You've got a lot of Friday data. Uh, and it is the end of the week. Uh, there is some squaring up of positions ahead of the weekend and stuff like that. Mohammed, oh, yeah, a lot of questions coming through now. I got some. I got some people's attention. <laughs> uh, Mohammed asks how to manage opening many positions at the same time. First of all, I'm not a big fan of lots of positions. Okay. So I think that the problem is with lots of positions is a lot of mental clutter. Okay, so 
I, I, I think that it's a good idea to keep the number of position, the number of markets that you watch limited, uh, get to know them well, and I think it's a good idea to keep the number of positions you have open limited, and to also understand the risk that's involved with multiple positions. Meaning, if you have correlated positions on, let's say that you have three yen pairs on. Well, obviously, if you have three yen pairs on, uh, there's a good chance that 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 they're all either going to work to in some magnitude, right? They're correlated, but magnitude is not taken into correlation. They may move in the same direction, but they're not going to move to the same extent. Uh, we've obviously seen that this week. Uh, you, know, you take euro yen, and then you take Aussie yen, for example, uh, not moving in the same you know extreme magnitudes, uh, but really I think you just you want to keep it down to where you've got maybe two three four positions max um, and you know I've I've, I've I, I think that a good concentration I don't I'm not a big fan of of quote-unquote diversification uh, when it comes to trading uh, I think that's more of a an investment portfolio thing and even then I like the idea of concentrating in a, in a few select ideas and kind of uh, in this case, putting all your eggs in one basket, if you will, uh, but with good risk management, of course. You know, you don't load up on just because you trade two positions versus ten doesn't mean that you'll load up that much more on the two uh, than you do the ten. You still want to keep good risk management, but understand that if you are going to take multiple positions, understand how they relate to one another and how they can work. And if you're risking, let's say, you're willing to risk one percent per trade, and you've got on seven ideas, you've got to assume that you could lose on every single idea. Right, and then if you do, you lose seven percent, right, or whatever your risk tolerance is. Can you handle that? That's what you got to ask yourself. <laughs> Aid, has anyone found a medicine tablet for discipline? <laughs> uh, I like I like that question. Uh, I because I because I'm always I'm on here. I'm one thing is I can't I can't beat discipline into you, and I you know I, I every every trader on, on every level. Uh, struggles to some capacity to maintain discipline. Um, that's why it's important to have that game plan. You know, it's important to have it down on paper. And I've talked about this. You don't have to have, you don't have to have sixty thousand different uh, uh, criterium. In fact, that's detriment to your ability to succeed. Um, I'm gonna pop a link in here. I don't know what happened to my link box. It's on uh, a checklist. We did a webinar once on checklist, and I think there we go. I'm gonna put this link in here, maybe. There we go. You guys should have it now. Uh, it's a checklist. It's a pre-trade checklist. So you have your game plan, and then in your checklist you should have trade criteria. And if your checklist is not being met, then and you're trading outside of your trading plan, then you're being undisciplined. And so you you can quantify your ability to to be disciplined. It, it, it's possible. Oh, John, <laughs> you actually talked about a checklist. I didn't even, I just saw, I'm, I'm kind of scrolling back and you have that question up there. Is there a checklist that I can check after an unsuccessful trade where I made a mistake? Um, yeah, I just I just put that in there. I, I, I just saw that. We're on the same wavelength. We're, we must be uh, the same universal uh, wavelength as is going between us. Um, yeah, so I mean, you have that checklist. You see that you know you you took a trade that wasn't on there that didn't fit your criteria. Then then you made a bad trade. And again, guys, don't define your trades by uh, good trades and bad trades. It is meaning uh, don't define your trades as bad trades or losers, good trades or winners because you could take and break all your rules and have a have a uh, a winner and you could you could follow every rule in the, in the book that you have and and you could have losers right that's just trading's about probabilities and you're not going to win every time but there are there are you know if you make money on a bad idea right where you broke your rules then you didn't really make a good trade you made a profitable trade but if you do that again and again and again you probably won't make money yeah sure Kim can I ask you what your your own win ratio is? Well, obviously the win ratio varies from with market conditions, but it's less than 50%. It's in the 40s. Uh, over average, it's in it's in the high 40s. So I'm I'm wrong more than I'm 
that I'm right. And and win ratio is something that you shouldn't get hung up on. It's it's harder to find, it's harder to be right all the time than it is to manage risk. And that's what I always say. So to manage risk, you know, if you have a good uh, risk reward ratio, so you could be you could be uh, forty five percent of the time you could be right, which means you're you're wrong fifty five percent of the time. Uh, some people can't really handle that. You know, they're like, oh, I hate because people don't like to be wrong, but that's just the nature of the business. But if you're, but if you have a good uh, risk reward ratio, where you're making say two pounds for every do uh, every pound that you're losing, uh, or whatever currency your account is denominated, a two to one, you know, reward to risk, then you're able to get away with having a uh, a low win win percentage. Now, I, I know traders that have win percentages that are as as low as in the in, in the high teens. Um, that make money, but they 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 have really good scaling strategies, and their risk reward per trade is very 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 good. Uh, and then there's other traders who will have a higher win percentage, but they have maybe like a lower they have a lower risk reward. Uh. And to answer your second question, Kim, do you close your positions over the weekend? Uh, generally, no, not unless there's something that could be really uh, market moving, and I don't have a a, a uh, a pos I don't have a cushion in that trade, so if I just entered the trade, well, I won't do this. But like, if we had something really big coming up, um, and which usually there isn't, we had something really big coming up over the weekend that, that everybody knew about, and I had a trade trigger on a Friday or whatever, I, I you know, I just I'll, I'll pass on it. But if I'm already in a trade. Uh, no, the only thing I may do is I may scale down on the the size and look to uh, to add back to that size once the market opens the next week. Um, but no, I don't I don't close trades just because of the because of the weekend. Some people do. Some people would you know would rather just like not screw up their weekend and <laughs> in case something happens. But you know I mean I again to me it comes down to event risk. And sure sometimes there's things that happen that are unforeseen and and those are the things that are out of our control. Uh, but you know, scaling back is not a bad idea uh, heading into a weekend. Neo says, "Hey Paul, I, by now I have tried a lot of strategies and did the hundred trades on uh, at least hundred trades on most, and I'm still losing money. Any advice on what I can do going forward?" Um, well, you have to look at you know why are you losing money? I mean, is is it is it because the strategies aren't very good? Um, you've really, you know, this is where where going over your your trade blotter, which or your trade confirmations and and whatnot, and your account, uh, and having a journal uh, where where you're you're kind of keeping a, a you know a, a steady a steady record of what you're doing will help you identify mistakes. Um, this is where I think having that checklist. I mean, are you are you following the strategies the way that you you should be as as you've defined them ahead of time, or are you perhaps breaking rules? Are you uh, maybe putting on too much risk per trade, and maybe you're inconsistently putting on risk? Maybe one time you're risking a half a percent, the next time you're risking two percent, and in that case you could have a good win percentage and and still lose money. So I would take a look at your risk management, which I always say is is you know, first and foremost, right? So take a look at your risk management and see and, and take a look at are you actually executing the strategies the way that they were meant to be executed uh, and see if, if you if you can't find some inconsistencies there that, that may help turn things around on that. That's a good point, Cedric. He says the greatest asset of a good trader is patience and it is so hard. <laughs> Uh, but again, you know, if you if you've got a trading plan in place and you've got if you've got themes or ideas that you're that you're watching and you say, you know what, I'm not going to do anything until this happens, uh, then you're being patient and and you're you're focusing on the process and you're not you know in that case then you're being disciplined as well. Um, and if if you uh, if you really come clean with yourself and you've got you know that checklist, and I'm not saying it has to be a physical checklist because some of you are going to be more experienced, and you don't really need to have that checklist. You don't need to sit there and, and check off boxes and and whatnot. Um, you know, it, it, you can do it in your head. Uh, I think that for the newer trader, you, certainly it's a good idea. It's good practice to do that, and then over time you won't have to. But you know, in that case, yeah, absolutely, having patience is it's such a hard thing to do. Uh, again, that's you know 
you don't want to get too close to the market because then you start watching every tick and then that's where your your mind starts to go uh, and you, you don't you don't have that patience and Neil lol let me know when you find that pill yeah, it's when you guys let me know too you know where you know where to find me at probson at dailyfx.com uh, email me the I'm sure somebody out there probably sells one <laughs> This day and age on the internet, I'm, I, I probably all each of us have one in our spam folder right now. Uh, John, another question is: I am behind the market with news. It seems some guys like you get the news much more faster than someone ordinary like me. Uh, for example, I was trading pound dollar uh, cable, and in a blink of an eye, everything changed. Where can I find what is happening? Like the pros. Oh, okay. Well, here let me let me let you in on something, John. And and for those of you who are who who know me and have been with me for quite some time, uh, I'm I don't I'm not the most timely on the news either. All right. I mean, it, it it's it's one of those things. I don't uh, I trade very technically oriented, and while I know that certain planned events are coming up and so then I adjust risk accordingly and my game plan accordingly um, I don't you know I don't I don't they don't sit there in front of a, a Bloomberg machine let's say for example which which can cost a, a couple thousand US dollars uh, per month to have I don't sit there in front of that and, and, and look at it and and uh, a lot of people use Twitter you know, they, if if something starts moving and happening, and they'll they'll there's there's a lot out there that that disseminate information pretty quickly on Twitter now. Um, we we post numbers and and stuff on on Twitter, so you know there's that's one way that people do it. But but you know I don't really. It's like something will happen and I'll go, okay, what well, what's going on here? Why why is this happening? Uh, but I trade very technically, uh, and and I don't you know if, if sudden things come out, it's it's you know that's that's part of what what happens and if you're on the right side of the market let's say your your analysis tells you to be long uh, and then then more often than not that news is likely to come out in the direction of the the trend if you're right uh, and if you're wrong then obviously it, it, it won't uh, but no I mean as far as you being ordinary like you uh, then I guess I'm just as ordinary as you <laughs> and a lot of and a lot of people are that a lot of pros that that you would think you know you'd think okay they're because we're not just sitting here looking at the the the, the news stream uh, constantly you know and it, it and as a trader it's more of a reactive thing it's like all of a sudden you see something move you go and you look and like I said Twitter all of a sudden you'll see oh Draghi said this or or whatever it is Carney said this and uh, or somebody did this and, and and then all of a sudden you'll be like oh this is why the market's moving and if you're a really short-term trader maybe you, you you jump in then you know so it's it's not like we we get the information and then and then start trading it like that I think that's a misconception that, that people think that there's just like this super informed group out there and that, that then there's everybody else and and that's really not the, that that truly isn't the case Kim, and I'm not I'm not laughing at these questions. I'm 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 laughing because it's I kind of I kind of chuckle because I mean it's I I I I know exactly what you guys are talking about and and I certainly have had those feelings as newer traders and so if I if I chuckle as I'm reading your question, it has nothing to do with me laughing at you. Uh, so I just want to say that. But uh, Kim says, do you always look to have a trade on, and do you feel frustrated if you haven't? Uh, the reason why I'm kind of laughing at that is because because that is a that is something that is easy to f find yourself. You know, you you don't have a trade on. You're not. You know, your P and L is not moving. You're not making money. You're well. You're. But here's the thing, Kim. You're not losing money either, are you? Uh, and so again, you know, it, it's. I, I don't look. No, I don't look to always have a trade on. And and there's times where I don't have a trade on for extended periods of time and, and when I say extended periods of time and maybe a few days what have you um, I if the market gets really dead in August which can be oftentimes a dead time of the of the year it can also be a very volatile time if, if there's some stuff going on uh, but oftentimes it's a it's kind of a vacation month especially the, the second half of August I may do nothing 
uh, if if things die down to nothing, then I, I I just I look to preserve. So, not making a trade is making a trade, right? That's a decision. You're making a decision not to trade, and that's because things aren't lining up. Again, it comes back to your game plan. If nothing's if nothing's out there, no, I don't feel frustrated now. You know, maybe maybe when I was younger, yeah, I I, I and newer to this, I I felt frustrated because I was like, okay, I'm not. I'm not doing something. Somebody's doing something, and uh, I, you know, I this person is making money. That person is making money. Why am I not? And then you know, you can't worry about other people, like I was saying earlier. <laughs> John, I like the way you laugh. <laughs> Eight asked, do you pay attention to the currency strength published by Daily FX? Uh, no, actually, I really don't. Um, I, 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 and, and I'm not saying you shouldn't. Uh, I, I don't. I don't pay attention to it. Um, I think it can be a good tool uh, for finding out where you know, just just in a in a quick in a quick uh, glance, seeing where their where the strength and weaknesses are. Um, I try to stay isolated in my own little bubble for the most part. Uh, this is where this is where that fine line comes in between between already. So for some of you, you already have you already have a good game plan. And you already know what you want to do. So I I always say that it's a good idea then to kind of reduce the noise at that point as much as possible and and keep it very very select as to what you pay attention to and who you pay attention to. Uh, and if you're still in the learning process, it's always very good to, to be open-minded uh, to, to a lot of different uh, analyst traders' perspectives and, and see what kind of fits with you because, you know, you, you, you don't really, it takes time to really know what, what makes sense to you. Sometimes something will just like a light bulb will go off. You'll be like, oh, that is, that is something that I really can like sink my teeth into and it makes a lot of sense to me and, and a lot of it has to do with your background whether it's it could be educational you know I've, I've said this before if you're somebody who's kind of the math type then you might find yourself uh, you might find yourself being able to uh, you know the quantitative stuff tends to tends to sit better with you and if if maybe you're not maybe you're not the math type and maybe you're more artistic and you like art or you like uh, you like charts like me I I, I would say that I'm, I'm kind of somewhere I straddle the the middle on that and I I'm, I, I kind of gravitate towards a little bit of both but that tends to be what I've found is that you know the more creative types will be looking for the chart patterns and and the more quantitative types will be looking for you know more of statistical type stuff that that validates their what they're trying to do. Eight says, "I get confused. If you get confused, then then walk away from it. Whatever it is, it could be me. <laughs> if you find something that I do confusing, you know, don't 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 uh, don't take it as the gospel because it's not. And as I've always said, and I'll say it a thousand times more, there is no right or wrong way to do this stuff. Okay, so what works for for me may not work for you." Uh, and and so you'll have to be able to put that filter on because you might see something that I do or don't do. People love Fibonacci, and I, I feel like I'm like the only one who doesn't talk about Fibonacci. So then that turns some people off, and some people like it that I don't. Everybody's got their own. Uh, everybody's got their own thing, you know. And, it, and again, it comes down to consistency and applying it. John says, could you explain a little bit about Forex hedging? Some people do not hedge with the pair, which is in danger. How to handle such a situation? I'm going to be perfectly honest with you, John. I think I think currency, I think hedging, and I and I think is what you're referring to is that like if you have, if you're long, let's say, euro dollar, right? You're long euro USD, and then you hedge it with a short euro USD. Can you just real quickly verify uh, if that's what you're talking about, that way I know how to appropriate that answer. Okay, okay, I'm gonna be perfectly honest with you, and that's what I thought you were you were getting at. I think it's a silly thing, <laughs> uh, and I'm gonna tell you why. 
because the same thing as having a say long let's say you're long 10 lots just give me an example you're long 10 lots of euro usd and you're like okay you know what i want to get out of half the position so you short five why not just sell five you see what i'm saying um, if you want to be flat why not just sell the whole position because net net it's effectively it's the same thing except you're just adding another layer of transactions right and, and in that case there's there, it, it really doesn't make sense I know there's this ability to do it um, you can't do it in the United States so I've actually never I've never done it uh, but I've the concept just really doesn't make a lot of sense to me so if you want to get out if you're if you want to get out of some of your position or you want to get flat then just then the simplest thing to do is just to exit it. But there is a psychological component uh, to it where the belief is that if I'm, say, I'm long 10 euros and then I, I hedge it, quote unquote, with 10, as soon as it starts to like, you know, I want to get be back to, to full long in this case, then I'll just take off my hedge. And like there's that psychological, like I'm trading around my position. But, you know, that's really something that, that I don't think is, it, it, it makes it for an unnecessary transaction. Tony, do you think it is important to include pictures of the right setups in your trading plans? Livermore had them in his head. Livermore, for those of you who don't know, Jesse's referring to Jesse Livermore. Uh, and there's a book that uh, that was written. It's actually uh, it's actually a nonfiction book, but uh, it, it's it's pretty close to. Jesse Livermore, I'm typing it in there. Uh, it's called Reminiscences of a Stock Operator. I think it's a great book to read, regardless of what market you trade. He actually traded commodities as well. So, and I'm sure if 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 FX was around back then, he would have traded those too, and he would have traded indices and everything because he was he was kind of like that. But anyways, uh, it's a good book to read. Reminiscences of a Stock Operator. Type in Jesse Livermore book uh, because I really, honestly, don't, I don't think I can spell reminiscences right now without having to think about it. <laughs> uh, but do you think it's important to include pictures of the right setups in your trading plan? Absolutely. Again, you know, take a snapshot. You know, get out the snipping tool. Uh, on, on, you know, a snipping tool comes with every operating system. Take out the snipping tool or if you're on TradingView. You can always, uh, you know, TradingView is, is good for this in that, you know, you can, you can go in here, you can draw, you can put in text. Right, and then you can just take a picture, throw it in your game plan, and and put in the ones that that you like, um, that that you that fit the best, and and, and kind of go over it and review it. I think it's a great idea, Tony, uh, because then it kind of it kind of burns a little circuitry in your head, uh, then as to as to what you're looking for, right? It kind of burns a pathway. So I think that that's a good idea. I think it's a good idea if you made a good trade and if you that you take and maybe take a snapshot of it where you entered, where you exit, and all that stuff. Maybe put some notes on the chart. And I also think that when you make a bad trade, you you, you kind of be like, what the heck was I thinking here? Right? What the heck was I thinking here? Why did I do this? And uh, and and then you you point out what what all was wrong about that trade, and and that way you try to make sure that you don't uh, you don't do it again uh, as much as possible, or at least mitigate the number of, of times that you do it. But yeah, I think it's a great idea. I take pictures every now and then. Still, actually, uh, now that I think about it, I have one on my desktop. Um, I didn't put any labeling on it. I just put a circle around a. Uh, I had a bunch of lines, and I put a circle. And there was actually another chart that uh, it was like a couple of weeks ago. It was an intraday chart of the Nasdaq 100, and I had like probably 10 or 12 lines on the chart, and uh, and I uh, and I and the title of the uh, the title of the picture when I you know had to just save it was uh, was NQ and then it was WTH what the heck but you know HE double hockey sticks uh, 
and I was looking at because it, it, there was just like a thousand lines I was drawing, and and I didn't do anything. But it, it when when I when I find that I have a thousand lines going up on my chart, it's time for me to just probably say, you know what, back away because you don't really know what's going on. All righty, I think it's been a pretty good session. I'll I'll, I'll field one or two more questions, and then um I got to jump off the mic. This has been we've been on here for an hour and fifteen minutes, haven't we? Time flies. Uh, I, again, tomorrow's London FX and CFD trading will not be going on. Um, we've got coming up here in about 45 minutes, we've got Chris Vecchio, for those of you who want to uh, listen in on, on his views. He's got excellent views on uh, central banks. You know, obviously, that's something that I don't really uh, – I don't really get into. I don't, you know, it's, but if you want to uh, join his webinar and listen in on, on something more on the fundamental level, I just dropped a link in there. You guys can always go and listen to what he's got to say. Uh, Tony, uh, how can you form a view on one market and then see every related market with unbiased eyes? That is a good question. Um, well, it takes time and experience to be able to do that, but certain markets. I mean, it, it depends on what you're doing here, but you know, you've got to you got to take correlation into consideration. And, and and when I say take it into consideration, I also mean don't put too much emphasis on it. Okay, correlation. Uh, for example, the dollar and gold is a very common one. So, you know, people will have a view on gold, but then they'll have a view on the dollar, and then they won't do anything with gold, or vice versa. And uh, you know you got to take those correlations with a grain of salt. Um, I, I you know when it comes to indices that can be problematic because there is a high degree of correlation you know between world markets. Uh, but I really I really personally just break it down and just say what is in front of me, what's going on here on this particular market on this particular chart because that's my my. Uh, almost exclusively chart based uh, and I just keep it just keep your world really small uh, and and just focus on what's in front of you and not worry so much like for example you know we've had some we've had some euro you know we've had some ECB draggy stuff going on and the DAX and the euro so then like they when you have these big things they they go in opposite directions what's good for the euro will be bad for the DAX and so you'll see that maybe like you know that'll start to infiltrate your your thought process. But if you're focusing on the euro, don't worry about the DAX so much. If you're focusing on the DAX, don't focus. Don't worry about what the euro is doing so much. Uh, and if you have positions in both, you know you need to be cognizant of how they relate to one another. But really, just keep your world small. Keep your world small. Just focus on the what's right in front of you right now, and that'll help kind of take some of that mental clutter out. Uh, and, and just kind of manage each thing on their own, right? Manage each trade on its own merit, uh, but also taking into total risk uh, into consideration on your account. Uh, and, and I think that, that by taking that mindset, it'll help kind of calm the noise down from, from having all these different markets doing different things at different times. All right, so that's it for today. It's it's been a it's been a good session. It's been a long session. I appreciate all your questions. It's been great. Um, and I you know we'll do this. Uh, I I'm gonna try to put together a lesson for next week. If you guys got any ideas, please, please feel free to email me. Uh, I'm just gonna throw up my. So you guys can follow me on Twitter if you're not already and if you want to. Uh, email P. Robinson Daily FX. If you got any ideas for webinars, uh, topics, please by all means uh, email me. Let me know. I always like to hear what's going on there. If there's something about the webinar you like or don't like, uh, you know, feedback is always always good. Uh, you know, just be respectful, I'm, and I'm sure most of you will. Uh, and you know, I don't. I, I I take criticism well, as I'm told. Uh, <laughs> I think it's a good thing to, to learn from, from other people's views. So anyways, uh, if you want to go back and watch this again, it'll be on the YouTube channel, and I will also archive it underneath my author name. Uh, so you guys can always go back and watch these things whenever you want, or if you came late, or if you don't come in the future, they're always around. Uh, they're not going anywhere. 
but next week I'm going to try to do a, uh, a topic. Uh, I have a couple days off in between, so I don't, you know, I don't know if I'll have a topic or not. We may end up doing another Q&A, but I'll try to get one to you. If you guys got to, again, if you've got any suggestions, let me know. Bangadi says another idea, the commitment of traders. Uh, are you talking about the COTs? Talking about the COTs, I think. Hmm. Yeah, that could be something I could put in there. We could do we could do one on on sentiment analysis or something like that. Um, that might be one that I think people would would find of interest. Thanks for the suggestion. All right, guys. Have a good one.